I'd like to introduce Dr. Batoni this morning. Her talk is entitled Thinking Like an Ecofeminist Observe, Critique, Construct. Dr. Batoni is a critical constructive scholar of religion, ecology, and social justice at Santa Clara University. She earned the MA History degree from the Graduate Theological Union in 2005 and her PhD in religion from Claremont Graduate University in 2015. She employs comparative feminist and qualitative research methods to study eco-food, sustainable agriculture, and climate concerns in religious contexts. For research and teaching, she studies religious, political, and ethnic pluralism as facets of community sustainability, encouraging students to encounter others' lives with respect and dignity. Her publications focus largely on contemporary US Muslims who express religious identity through ecological food practices. Among family and friends, she enjoys hiking local hills, tinkering in her community garden plot, cooking and eating seasonally, and singing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Batoni. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Okay, I offer my sincere thanks to the wonderful organizers of this day and program, Elizabeth Allison, Kim Carfor, and Elizabeth McAnally, and the invaluable student helpers. Um, thank you. I'll begin with a poem. This moment of aliveness, gray skied pre-dawn in the clear air near my window, a red bird trills, perched on the highest branch of the highest treetop, repeating her song until the sun crests the horizon. I don't know this bird's scientific name, but we share this moment of aliveness and celebrate dawn singing. Although my talk is largely cultural critique, I wanted to begin by acknowledging acknowledging life's preciousness, worth protecting, and worth inhabiting. The myriad lives in our local to global living systems with whom we have evolved and without whom we would not be human. So. So, my plan for today is to talk about ecofeminists and ecofeminism, um, thinking about questions, methods, and definitions that frame my interpretation of the work of ecofeminists. I'll offer some examples of ecofeminists who call themselves ecofeminists, as well as current issues framed within this method that I'm calling ecofeminist. And then I'll have some concluding thoughts. So what is an ecofeminist? The act of defining itself is a kind of privilege. It's an insider task. But to avoid colonial undertones, it must remain partial rather than universal, rooted in a perspective rather than hovering above material reality. Who? For today, I'll give examples, specific examples, of ecological and feminist projects where participants critique exploitation and gesture toward constructing viable, life-giving alternatives. I'll start with self-identified ecofeminists and then apply an ecofeminist lens to contemporary issues addressed in the Me Too and climate justice movements. Ecofeminists may be of any gender, but when speaking generally, I'll use she and her. What? What does she do? This will be specific to each case. When? Circulation of the term ecofeminism began with French feminist Françoise Daubonne in 1972. Similar work began earlier and gained steam in the 1980s and 1990s. This is just a very quick overview. Uh, 1980s, 1990s, followed by sharp critique of its essentialist interpreters. Um, the term's usage reduced a bit in the early 2000s. And, but nevertheless, some of us persisted and uh, maintained the need for systemic thinking um, around gender and earth. More recently, with the wider contemporary feminist reawakening, ecofeminism is again being reinvigorated. Why? 
Perhaps since you chose to spend your time here today, this needs no explanation. But in the words of the Ecofeminist theologian and my beloved mentor, Rosemary Radford Ruther, converting our minds to the earth cannot happen without converting our minds to each other. Since the distorted and ecologically dysfunctional relationships appear necessary, but they actually support the profits of the few against the many. Ruther's words confirm observation of a need for change, critique of relationships distorted by greed and inequity among people and between humans and other living beings. Ecofeminist method. So as a scholar of lived religion, I will turn to the work of ecofeminists by providing a framework or ecofeminist method, which will become clearer through citing examples. The framework, I assert, is based on my commitments to ensure scholarship does not remain isolated from people's real lives, but instead re relates directly to concrete material activities, both expre expressing critique and constructing more viable me means to meet shared goals. Observe. Any study has a lens which roots in a value system. For example, a colonial eye looks for what can be extracted. Um, grounded, this eye is grounded in exploitation, taking what is not yours. Empirical thinking is a scientific means to establish fact that may lead to innovation, but can prioritize instrumental value, reducing wholeness to reductionist use value. It can veer toward a colonial lens, but also in other directions, fulfills a crucial role in providing data, for example, for policymakers to make informed decisions based on facts. A lens of solidarity prioritizes relationships. Through, the, through this lens, we can witness suffering, encounter a person, situation, or living system in an attentive, holistic way, listening not for reloading in order to criticize or fight back, but to fully understand, to know and be known. What constitutes accurate understanding? This is a question. Religious studies requires attention to how people understand themselves in the world, how people relate with each other and with living beings in living systems. Critique begins with a value statement. Something is broken and it needs to be fixed. It requires accurate understand, uh, understanding, but this may be subject to debate. Applying critical attention has been also called deconstruction. Through critical thinking, we can see that local problems relate to larger issues with potentially global dimensions. Thinking beyond human beings as individuals to systems, thinking beyond specifics to patterns, Understanding design flaws that operate through institutions such as U.S. systemic racism, high maternal death rates, or pervasive sexism exposed by the Me Too movement. Critique applies a moral ethical lens to problems saying this is unacceptable. And it brings out questions like what is valued, what is missing, what risks are acceptable, and whose lives matter. So construction. The task of critique is incomplete without vision toward constructing my, what might work better. Active engagement at the intersection of ethical ideas and practice are called praxis. Construction moves beyond observation and critique to problem solving. Some constructive gestures reinscribe re a colonial lens by asserting one answer to rule them all. The only way to stop climate change is to do X. But drawing on a backdrop of pluralism leads to coalitional thinking and actions. Humility, sharing ideas, working alongside and respecting diverse means to address common problems. Solidarity, across differences, we can agree on common ground but need not unify in a monolithic or homogenizing way, thus losing crucial intersectional tones. Cross-cultural mutuality, learning with and from each other, acknowledging the value of multiple approaches and perspectives while maintaining a critical eye to see and address exploitative relations among individuals and within systems. So, to define ecofeminism, 
the observe, critique, construct framework or method was born from my qualitative research with three communities across the US where religion, sustainable agriculture, and meaning making intertwined. In interviews with Catholic, Muslim, Buddhist, Jewish, and religiously unaffiliated people who led agricultural projects, I inserted a question at the end of my interview that received a few shrugs, blank looks, a few looks askance, and one pushback. I asked if my interviewees were familiar with the term ecofeminism. This interview <coughs> question and my interviewees' responses pushed me as a scholar to generate a more constructive ecofeminist definition. Here is the critical definition of ecofeminism I shared with my interviewees. Ecofeminism critiques domination and exploitation in relations with land, living beings, and marginalized people, including women. And ecofeminism offers a variety of alternative views, ethics, and practices that counteract it. Exploitation. In response to interview conversations, I developed a definition for ecofeminism beyond a critical lens, asking what ecofeminism can do in the positive. Ecofeminism is a late 20th and 21st century political, intellectual, and religious spiritual movement promoting vitality, compassion, and resilience for individuals and communities of living beings, drawing inspiration and analysis from connections between various feminisms and ecologies. So, the optics show that all three ecofeminists that I cite as examples experienced light skin privilege in their respective contexts in North and South America. Yet they leveraged whatever privilege they enjoyed toward solidarity with those that did not share that privilege. As scholars, they enjoyed educational privilege, but as female scholars in the late 20th century, thank you, their work and their persons were subject to intense scrutiny, critique, and misogyny. As ecofeminists, they were critiqued by various scholars, ecologists, theologians, feminists that disliked their intent to connect concerns for nature, animals, and various marginalized peoples, while prioritizing a gender-attuned lens. Rosemary Radford Ruther observed a saturation of sexism, marginalization of human beings, and degradation of the earth. In her critique, she said, sexism and other exclusionary ideologies are expressed through sacralized means. She located these problems in institutions and in theological projections that reinforce exclusion <coughs> and marginalization. To construct, Ruther sought spaces for diversity and inclusion in decision making, idea forming, and norming. She is anchored to a value of solidarity. Her writing consistently aims to tell the truth about people's lives beyond a comfortable distance of theological ideas to the verifiable contested histories of marginalized bodies living in oppressive social systems. She not only unearthed ancient voices subjugated in their time, but amplified contemporary voices asserting their dignity despite marginalization. Much more could be said about Ruther, but for the sake of applying the method to a variety of ecofeminist eco voices and current social movements, onward. Marty Keel, uh, in the first story of her book, Nature Ethics, she's making phone calls, trying to save local wildlife, uh, wild animals' lives. The person she calls assures her that aggregate numbers of the species were fine, so these were not important to save. Here, the intersection of a colonial view meets an instrumental scientific view. Species numbers are fine. These can die without ethical dilemmas. Her book goes on to develop a line of inquiry around masculinity and sport hunting, which can reduce animal subjectivity to species, herds, or trophy kills. Her critique was that suffering animals are local, specific, individual beings that hold value beyond any use for humans. This is not a generalized, diffuse, or impersonal <coughs> view. In her construction, Keel's ecofeminist philosophy is anchored in inherent value for animals, expressed through specific relationships of care where people live out their ethics. Keel asserted a relational ethic of care beyond species concerns to real relationships with specific animals. Her nature ethics are grounded in personal relationships with real individuals where love can take place. Ivoni Guevara observed the suffering of the poor, particularly women, in her home country of Brazil. She critiqued systems that impoverish people, particularly women, and she constructed theologies and direct relief projects that empower poor women. In her words, 
quote, in adopting an ecofeminist perspective, which is a combination of social feminism and holistic ecology, what I have changed is my point of view, my way of looking at the world, at people, and at events. Through ecofeminism, I have begun to see more clearly how much our bodies, my body, and the bodies of my neighbors are affected not just by unemployment and economic hardship, but also by the harmful effects of the system, the system of industrial exploitation imposes on them. Ibarra's observations distilled in her a value-based critique of systemic exploitation of her neighbors, and through her writing, her organizing of ecofeminists in South America through Conspirando Collective, and her direct relief work in Brazil, she has made a life of ecofeminist practice. This framework of observe, critique, construct could be applied to numerous other scholars and activists who self-identify as ecofeminist or eco-womanist. But since others on the panel have given attention to similar threads and themes, I'll move forward with an assessment of the Me Too and climate justice movements. To be clear, the term ecofeminist does not necessarily represent these movements in their fullness, as it is not a central defining force from a majority of those involved. Yet, the observed critique construct framework arises without difficulty, demonstrating themes in parallel with ecofeminists Ruther Keel and Gabara. Of all the examples, I will give the most attention to the Me Too social movement in order to offer one more elaborated interpretation today. So, the Me Too movement, Twitter storm, lifted the lid on chilling cultural saturation in which unwanted sexual attention toward feminine bodies is the norm, not the exception. Violent or coercive experiences were not outliers, but center stage in a litany of locations and professions too numerous to name. Whether in heart-wrenching detail or in the simple words, me too, the social media campaign created a cultural prism to see what was already there, but previously hidden from common sight. Those of us who work to empower students know how challenging and pervasive rape culture is, even among educated, self-respecting young people. This problem is not simply constituted by individuals expressing themselves sometimes in ways that exploit women, but rather reflects a structured injustice, not random or isolated, but a socially learned, economically supported institutional problem. That's the observation. Critique. Famous and not so famous people who have been overwhelmingly male have misused their power and undermined the bottom bodily integrity of women. The focus on cis women does not reduce the importance of addressing coercion and, and violence against gender non-binary, male, and trans people, but rather exposes systemic gendered violence against persons dehumanized by their assailants. Toxic masculinity has been defined away from maleness, a bold move which clarifies that not all men express themselves in destructive ways, despite their social exposures that normalize such behavior. Toxic masculinity instead features an instrumental view of women's bodies in which a person is commodified or reduced to an object or product to consume. As such, she is exploitable like a natural resource devoid of inherent value. Thankfully, a cultural backlash asserts a renewed rejection of those who try to take what isn't theirs, recognizing infantile grabbing as assault as part of a worldview that is distorted and distorting. The extent of the problem cannot be denied. Construct. The Me Too movement presents a watershed in human dignity and human rights, a sharp reminder that women are people and people can be fierce when organized. An underlying value for bodily integrity and autonomy pervades this movement, recognizing that women's rights are in fact human rights. This movement has offered individuals the social support to confront not only perpetrators, but the isolating legacy of shame. Those who do not recognize these values must be held accountable, both at individual and structural levels. Accountability has taken the form of losing jobs, losing media entities, valuable possessions, powerful roles. But controversy remains as legal proceedings have been bypassed by pressures to simply step down with implications for the robustness of legal methods to address both individual and systemic justice. When perpetrators never see the inside of a courtroom, what happens to systemic accountability? What will address the problem at its root? What will affirm or restore human dignity? How can this pervasive rape culture become transformed into a culture of consent? 
The Me Too movement has shown social media capable of cohering crucial critique. Constructive voices may, less, may be less unified than critical ones, but certainly develop in varying visions of how to live into greater accountability, dignity, and consent-based interactions. Like Keel's call to see animal lives valued in their unique individual relationality, rather than generalized animal subjects of hunting for sport, the Me Too movement aims to reduce the sickening sport of woman hunting displaying the distorted lens that refracts the wholeness of female human beings into interchangeable, exploitable bodies subject to use value. Ecofeminism locates a pattern in reductionist thinking across bodies, landscapes, and living systems. Those who seek to exploit women's bodies are not unrelated to those ready to suck the marrow out of our living systems until they no longer function. An exploitative worldview pervades the mind of the sexual pre predator and the self-interested financier who funds development by deforestation, the manufacturer who designs and sells inessentials that will never biodegrade, the policymaker who looks aside when major donors dump toxic waste into fresh water headed downstream to a poor person's kitchen sink. The Me Too movement, of course, is distinct and analogies only go so far. Yet the issue ecofeminists reiterate is the problematic worldview accompanying degrading actions against the lives and lands whose values cannot be quantified. So climate justice. Observe, finally we turn to cl climate justice, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Thanks. Okay, I'll be quick. Uh, policymakers to the extent of the problem, the known factors and areas of opacity. These observations confirm with no reasonable doubt that intensifying weather events reflect global warming of the seas, air, and surface of the earth based on anthropogenic factors. Human beings industriously generating a planet where we can no longer safely live. Critique, climate injustice is the notion that people who contribute least to the problems of climate change suffer most from its effects. Wealthy, industrialized people who make business and policy decisions, a very small percentage of the human population, control access to resources and, de and decisions that affect the rest of us, construct. Changing structures so that decision-making power returns to the people affected by those decisions. For example, the UN, Me the Me Too and Women's March movements, as well as the UN, have prioritized increasing numbers of women in political office as a means to increase environmental and human rights goals. Another layer is cha challenging people who think extractively, who continue to expect that exploiting people's work and natural resources is acceptable in thought or action. According to Oxfam in 2017, 80% of global wealth accumulated to the richest 1% of people. This level of inequality must be addressed in order for any kind of justice to prevail. Worker justice, climate justice, environmental justice, racial justice, femi feminist justice, and more. So in conclusion, our historical moment contains horrifying scientifically and culturally undeniable truths. Pervasive exploitative activities are linked to global climate change and rape culture. Yet, a twisting of pluralistic inclusion has rendered climate change as if it were a matter of belief. Similarly, increasingly, violent perpetrators' rights appear to be viewed on par with those of assault victims. Yet, these are not the only stories. According to credible scientific evidence, human-made pollution infuses our planet from the high atmosphere to the deepest depths of the seas. From industrially produced food to the precious nourishment our mammalian bodies offer to our young. But the pollution does not issue from the obvious tailpipes of cars or the spurious positivism of industrialist ventures that dump their waste wherever they please and pay the fines if there are any. No, the pollution is of the mind that cannot see the person next to him on the train or in traffic, cannot fathom the humanity of the woman across the room, cannot see the wholeness of the human being honestly working, yet unable to afford rent, food, medicine, or papers to stay in a safer country than the one where he was born. Dehumanization is a sad, socially reinforced disease of the heart and mind, which plays out materially among people, social systems, and environmental systems, or in traditional 20th century feminist parlance, personally and politically. 
The results of our pollution saturation does not play out equally for all people in all places. Privileges provide insulation from real challenges faced by the majority of human bodies on the planet. Privileges such as access to health care, clean water, clean air, clean soil, clean food. The privilege to affect decisions that affect your life and livelihood. The privilege to participate in pers personal and community well-being, including bodily integrity and autonomy. Yet in eco-feminist activities, although forests have been reduced to stumps, people learn to plant. Yes, perpetrators perceive their power may mean they just let you do it, but the millions of silent silence breakers testify to another story. As studies continue to prove the existence of climate change as reliable as it can prove the existence of gravity, humanity continues to need to match thinking with action, action with thinking. Ecofeminism and its definitions are only important as much as they serve the long-term health and well-being of our planetary home, which we experience through our local lives, our sense of solidarity with the sufferings and hopes of the people around us, our sense of aliveness with our neighbors, the singing birds, swaying trees, cuddling pets and scampering coyotes that screech in the night of local ranches and forested hills. Whether or not you have affinity for the term ecofeminism, I sincerely hope we all, in our myriad ways, express affinity for the living beings with whom we share this irreplaceably precious home. Through our lives and work, we can participate in liberation, sustainability, solidarity, and justice by lifting up those suffering on the margins, by speaking out about injustice, and by returning home to our own existence, contoured by our mammalian ancestry and enriched by observations and critiques the only moment where we can construct our future. Thank you.